Hello and welcome to this evening's um, live author event, live from Salt Lake City tonight. And we are so happy to be able to do this. I um, I am Stina from the English Bookshop and I am just here to wish you all a very, very warm welcome and tell you how excited we are about um, Mackenzie Lee, she is a brilliant author um, and I love her books, but enough about that. I just wanted to tell you a bit about the English bookshop, or the English bookshops of, of Uppsala and Stockholm. We are a small independent bookshop. Uh, we opened in Uppsala in 1995 and in Stockholm in 2008 and your support means everything to us. We wouldn't be able to do anything without you. And you've been so supportive during this last year, which has been really tough on, on all of the bookshops all over the world. So we're especially happy to have you here tonight. And um, of course, if you haven't read Mackenzie Lee's books, I would really, really recommend you to um, buy them through the links in um, in the live stream uh, or through our website and tonight you can actually have them ordered and signed with a book plate. This is, this is not, as you probably can see, uh, Mackenzie Lee's signature. It's a, it's a completely different author. It's Joe Walton, but you can have um, similar book plates um, addressed to you, but you can also buy signed copies through their links in in the live stream or at frontbookshop.se. And um, this whole event is a collaboration between the, the um, English bookshops and Uppsala Stadsbibliothek, which and it's it's so amazing that we can do these things this year. That's one good thing about the pandemic, isn't it? That <laughs> we can actually reach out to authors all around the world because, well, we don't normally have um, brilliant authors from the US in the shop that very often. We do, but not very often. But this year we can make it easy for us. Um, but if you're ever in Uppsala, um, the library is just across the street from the English bookshops. So make sure you pay them a visit also and get all your bookish needs attended to. I will now leave you in the capable hands of Johanna Lundin, who will moderate this event. And of course, tonight's guest of honor, Mackenzie Lee. Woo! <laughs> Yay! Hello, <laughs> Hi, Mackenzie. Uh, as you know, the pandemic has made everything digital. And if we were, uh, with the audience live, this would be the time for a round of applause. So since you can't hear them, you can at least hear me. So yay! <laughs> and hello, how are Thank you? Thank you. I'm so good. I'm so happy to be here with you guys. I This is the first, I think it's the first Zoom event I've done during the pandemic. I, I feel very out of practice doing events. <laughs> Well, it's such an honor to have this conversation with you and to have read your books. I have devoured them uh, during oh. the last couple of weeks. Uh, and tonight we will uh, focus mainly on the Montague siblings uh, and these books. But I will start off with a brief uh, introduction. Uh, as Stina said, this is a collaboration with uh, Uppsala Public Library and their YA, re um, YA book club, which is so awesome. I'm so sad that I have passed the young adult age <laughs> gap and now count as a regular adult <laughs> because I would have loved to be a part of their book group. Uh, and they meet up every now and then and read an English book and discuss it amongst themselves. And some of them are watching tonight and some of them have also sent in questions uh, as you, the audience, can also do in uh, the live chat. You can type your questions for Mackenzie and we will take them at the end of the conversation. 
So Mackenzie Lee, welcome to uh, this conversation. Uh, and you are an author of numerous books, most famously maybe, uh, The Monstrous Thing and also the, as of now, a geology <laughs> uh, with two books and a novella. Uh, I was about say it's, a, it's a do and a half ology. Yeah. <laughs> five ology. Yeah. Uh, we will get back to that uh, <laughs> later, I think. Um, about the Montague uh, siblings. So we have The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue which is the first one. And that has uh, the gentleman's guide of getting lucky, which I love. Uh, and I also love the covers of these, uh, which mm -hmm. is uh, the, the half one. Uh, and then uh, the most recent uh, is then the lady's guide to petticoats and piracy, uh, which has a character with the same name as me. Um, so you can imagine uh, me feeling really attached to that you're predisposed to love it <laughs> yeah um so i will encourage all of you who have not read the books to uh, as stina said buy them and get them signed from mackenzie so um my first question then for you is if you can start off by telling us some you know uh insightful clues to the the Montague siblings, we have Henry or Monty and Felicity, who are the main characters in the books. Um, yeah, if you can start off by that. Yeah, um, so the main character of The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue, which is the first one, is uh, his name is Henry Montague. Uh, he goes by Monty. The books are set in 18th century uh, England slash kind of they end up going all over Europe. So uh, they're set in the 1700s uh, and the books in general are sort of tributes to historical adventure novels, but populated by characters that you traditionally maybe don't always see in historical adventure novels. Um, and so Henry Monty, as he likes to be called, uh, it feels kind of sacrilege to call him Henry. He wouldn't like that very much. No, uh, only his no, father no. <laughs> tells him, you know, yeah. tells him like that. Yeah. Um, so Monty is a a young nobleman in 1700s England who is about to take over his father's estate, um, and as many young men do at that or did at that age, uh, before he does that, he's going to take a grand tour of Europe, and the grand tour was this uh, phenomenon in the 1700s and 1800s where if you were young and rich and white and a guy, um, and you had that sort of awkward period of time between finishing school, and then you had to wait for your dad to die so you could take over the estate. Uh, often what you would do was spend uh, sometimes several years abroad on the continent, and you would live in the sort of cultural capitals of Europe, and you would see art and the opera and experience culture and learn languages. But the other purpose of it was you were supposed to like sow your wild oats a little bit and maybe drink yourself sick a couple of nights and uh, kind of get that out of your system before you then came back to England to be a member of the peerage. Uh, so Monty's about to go on his grand tour. Uh, he's going with his best friend, Percy, uh, who he is, he thinks pretty secretly in love with, but it's pretty unsecret. He's pretty uh, <laughs> obvious about it. Uh, he's also traveling with his little sister, Felicity, uh, who thinks he thinks is kind of a stick in the mud prig. She's going to finishing school. So Monty's only consolation is they get to drop her off in France uh, before they take the rest of the tour. Um, and he is struggling with the idea of his future. Uh, he's kind of lost his way in the past couple of years before the book starts. He has been dealing with uh, an abusive father with his own sexuality and his sense of self. And then he's been self-medicating with booze and drugs and women and lots of bad choices and so uh the book is set across the course of their grand tour uh it sort of kicked off when monty makes a spectacularly bad decision at the palace of versailles that then makes the three of them him percy and felicity the targets of this uh manhunt that sends them all across europe uh so the second book is about felicity it's from her point of view it takes place a couple of years after the gentleman's guide um felicity is uh not not sort of the the boar that Monty thought she was. She's very uh 
she's very pragmatic. She's very scientific. She really wants to be a doctor in spite of how badly 18th century England does not want her to be a doctor. And so she's been trying for several years to sort of fight back against these institutions that have barred her uh, from medicine because of her sex. Um, and she's getting frustrated. She's running out of money. She's running out of options. She doesn't know what to do. And so she ends up allying herself uh, with the the daughter of a of a pirate lord uh, so that she can go to Europe to meet with uh, or to sort of re re meet with her friend, Joanna. Um, who she was best friends with in childhood and who they had a spectacular falling out. But now Joanna is marrying Felicity's favorite scientist, like her all time idol of all time ever. And so Felicity is sure she can just show up at the wedding of her <laughs> ex best friend whom she wronged, uh, and then impress her future husband, her friend's future husband with her, her brilliant brain and her knowledge of medicine and all doors will then be open to her. And of course it gets more complicated than that um, and becomes again about these three women traveling across Europe doing science and piracy together. So that was a long description, but that's sort of a little bit about the two, the two books. And then you have the novella in the middle, um, which is, uh, is literally just a, a hundred pages about Percy and Monty trying to have sex for the first time and being thwarted at every, at every turn. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it is uh, it is a ride, that's for sure. Uh, I mean, when a book is starting off with a map, <laughs> you know that. Uh, that made me so happy. I love the maps, and I'm so yeah. happy they're in the book. <laughs> Uh, and and I you know I flip back to them uh, from time to time to see where you know where they were and where they were going, okay. yeah. um, and and that was um, such a good summary uh, of the books and some of the characters uh, or characteristics of the characters that I love. I mean Percy, who is the best friend of of uh, Monty, I'm. I, I've so adored him. He seems to be such yeah. a sweet person. And in some ways, yes, these are historical novels, but there are characteristics of any, you know, contemporary YA or uh, with, and that was one of the things that I reacted to first was, oh my God, there is this <laughs> drinking and <laughs> fornication and you know living the wild life and in some way the grand tour is like a gap year <laughs> where, it is. Exactly where America, it is. you know they go to europe as if europe is a con you know it's a continent but seen as you know one country and uh -huh. in a way that grand tour is still alive and it's still something that people can recognize you know go on on a sort of adventure, finding yourself before you settle down, go to the university or yeah. start your career or whatever. Uh, yeah. So in a way that is very relatable, I feel. And that's something I love about history so much and something that uh, was really inspiring in, in the, the formation of these books is the way I think the world changes, but people really don't. And we see the same the same things throughout the centuries and exactly what she said, which is the, the, it's the 18th century gap year. Um, and when I kind of put that together, that was sort of the, the genesis of the book for me. And I, I love, I love seeing these parallels in history and seeing time repeat itself for better or worse. Um, and I have always found it very comforting to know that we are sort of, we are not alone and we are not the first generation or the first people who are, are going through these things or experiencing these things. Yeah. Um, and, and I then wonder, the grand tour, was that something that came first? And then you, you know, came up with everything else in the novel? Or, yeah, how did it come about to choose the grand tour as the starting point for, for this adventure story? So I studied history when I was in, in university and had plans to be an academic and very quickly discovered that I was not not suited to academia very well. Um, and part of it was just that my writing style was was not what you needed it to be to be an <laughs> academic. And I, I had I'd a professor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to use too many four letter words. Um, 
I had one of my professors though tell me that my my papers read too much like novels, and she said you can't write dialogue for Henry V, and you can't <laughs> write these scenes about Richard the Third pacing his tower, brooding. She's like, you don't know that happens. And I was like, well, that's what I want to be writing about. Uh, so I ended up kind of switching over and to, to creative writing when I did uh, my my postgraduate work. Uh, but in university, I I was a teaching assistant for a history a sort of intro to history class. Uh, that was all centered around the grand tour. So the teacher had come up with this brilliant structure to introduce her students to the sort of like history of the humanities by saying, if you were a young man taking your grand tour in the 1700s, here's where you'd go and here's what you'd see. And so we would, you know, your first stop is Paris and we'd deep dive into some of the art there and talk about some of the culture there and the different uh, art movements. And it was, it was my first exposure to the idea of the grand tour. I'd never heard that before. But I had just come back from living in Europe for a year, um, <laughs> and I had been—I'd been going to university there. Uh, but English university—I was in England, and English university and uh, American university are structured very differently. So I had way more free time in England than I than I expected to, and so I ended up traveling a lot, and I was doing a lot of the the sort of student thing where. I would buy the cheapest Ryanair flight I could find for, for 10 pounds and stay in these like grubby, terrible hostels where I'm shocked I didn't get some like some disease. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then uh, I would I would travel around and I was seeing everywhere I could. And I was so like I felt so changed by that year in a way that that we you kind of only talk about in terms of corny travel, Pinterest images um but i really felt like my whole my whole world expanded tremendously that year through the people i met and the places i went and seeing things i had only read about and even learning about myself and um uh developing a sense of independence and self-sufficiency and it was also the first time i really lived away from home and lived away from the place i grew up in and so it was developing a sense of self away from the people and the places that had sort of raised me and it was such a formative year for me. And then to come back and immediately learn about this grand tour and exactly what you said, be like, oh my gosh, people in the 18th century were doing this exact same thing. And I thought that was so cool. Um, and I was, I was not a, I didn't have creative writing on my, my horizon yet as a career choice, but I remember thinking that would be such a good setting for an adventure novel. And I've always loved adventure stories. It's always sort of that like lightly anachronistic historical adventure is my favorite genre of anything. And so I just sort of filed it away and uh, held on to it for a long time. Um, and then several years later, after I sold my first book, which was called This Monstrous Thing, I had a I had a two book contract. So uh, I wrote This Monstrous Thing and sold it. And then they sort of bought the untitled second book as well. Uh, and Monstrous Thing didn't sell very well. I, I laughed to myself when you said the book I'm most famous for is Monstrous Thing because that is my... <laughs> I, I, I say it's wildly unread. Um, it's a very niche, it's a very niche book and I love it, but it has a very specific audience. Uh, anyway, uh, so I had to write sort of this untitled second book. My first book had kind of flopped spectacularly and I didn't really know what I wanted to do and everything felt very backwards because before I had always written what I loved and then kind of put it out there to see if anyone else wanted it or if any publishers or agents wanted it. And now I was writing with an agent, with a publisher, with expectations like it was just it felt very backwards and um i was going through some mental health stuff at the time related to sort of this big career shift and and learning to commodify art and trying to not base my sense of self on my book sales and it was just like it was a big difficult moment for me and i was trying to write a different book entirely uh that was really sad and it was set in uh Chicago in the turn of the century and it was about factories and everybody was like dying and losing limbs <laughs> and getting cholera and it was so depressing and I was depressed and I ended up I I finally told myself you need to just write something fun and you just need mm. to write something silly and nobody's ever going to read it. I sincerely thought no one is ever going to read this book make it as goofy and as inappropriate and as wild like nothing is too wild for this book put in all the tropes they can be they can be listening at keyholes and they can be eavesdropping at the opera and having like <laughs> being chased by highwaymen like all these ridiculous tropes I love and so I wrote this book sincerely just for myself to remind myself why I why I did this and that I loved history and I loved this career and I loved writing um, and then eventually hit a point with my sad depressing cholera book where 
I either had to rewrite it again for like the 15th time because it wasn't working or I had to try something else. And I sort of offhand mentioned to my editor, I was like, well, I've got this other thing that I kind of have been tossing around. It's really different. I don't know if it's what you guys would want. Um, and she read the first chapter and the synopsis and was like, yeah, this is, I think, I think we yeah. should go with this instead. <laughs> and that, so yeah, that's, they, they kind of came from me having my own, my own grand tour and my own year abroad. Uh, and then just just waiting for the right moment for a bunch of in- things I was interested in to sort of magnetize in my head and, and make the story. Which is uh, really common, I think, um, for how life turns out. You think you ha- you might have a plan, you know, I'm going to the university, I'm going to study this, and then I'm going to work with this and that. And then out of serendipity and coincidence, something else happens or you go you go on a trip or you meet someone or you don't get into that first choice university course and you end up going to your second choice which then you know you fi- fall in love with that subject and that becomes your major instead or and and that you really don't know where life will take you and and to go with with your heart and what brings you joy can then bring other people tremendous amount of, of joy. So I'm I'm so happy that you know you you took your grand tour that then ended up being a literary grand tour. Yeah. Life is very random, exactly like what you said. And sometimes there's so much weighted on these small decisions we make and happenstance. And I I have to not think about it sometimes or else I freak myself out by like how how close because I actually like I went to my second choice university I didn't get into my first choice university had I not gotten in I probably would have been paying a lot more money on tuition or had I gotten in I would have been paying a lot more money on tuition I wouldn't have gotten to go abroad like you do the the butterfly effect of it and spin it out and it's like oh god I don't know I'm I'm happy with where I am and I'm so lucky to have had this career that I can't think about too hard how sort of how many things had to fall in line for it to happen (laughs) I mean, uh, Monty has this idea of doing the grand tour. He's going with Percy and they will have this year together and he's really looking forward to it. And then something ends up in a pocket at a party, which then alters all their <laughs> all their plans. So that is uh, a theme in the book as well. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I know. I have yep. metaphorically pocketed a lot of puzzle boxes in my <laughs> life that have sent me on a totally different course than I than I expected. Yeah, which is not, uh, I have learned, not as uh, comforting as I like to think of it uh, when talking to young people uh, who are, you know, super stressed with not knowing what they're going to do with their lives. And I'm like, well, I'm 30. Now I'm older than that, but <laughs> uh, I'm 30 and I don't know what's you know, going to happen. Right. And that freaks them out even more. Well, well <laughs> I am like, you don't know, but it will be okay. <laughs> it's okay. I wish yeah. I could go, the, the number one thing I wish I could go back and tell my younger self at basically every age, and I'll probably think this even like next year about this year, is just to be less stressed about planning everything and and trying to create this perfect future and instead I I wish I could go back and tell myself like just do things just yeah. try things you don't have to have a plan you don't have to know where it's going you don't have to do things uh like you can have hobbies and have interests and it doesn't have to be leading to something grander or bigger or have mm. some sort of ulterior motive just do things because you love them and they're interesting and fun and you have a good time and things will fall into place yeah. <laughs> so that's the message today. One is yeah. buy, buy and read Mackenzie's book. And two, don't put, be so hard on yourself. Enjoy. Exactly. Don't stress. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, book, for so coming. Can, <laughs> buy my book so I can continue to not stress about me. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm an, uh, an avid reader uh, and I love YA um, and all kinds of literature. But what I'm hesitant is to read historical novels. So when uh, I was introduced to your, uh, your books, I was like, oh, well, I'm not that keen on historical fiction due to the representation when it comes to race, sexuality, uh, gender norms, um, and for me as a POC, a person of color, 
I'm, you know, the, it's not that very happy portrays of, in, in my case, for black people. Okay, so then comes slavery. Um, and to be able to read an adventure, a historical adventurous story and to be as engaged as I was, uh, I was flipping the page like a mad person because I didn't, first I didn't want it to end, but I didn't, you know, I also wanted to know what was going to happen. And these books are something totally different from what I thought I was going to get and also what's out there in general. So for that, I, I want, just want to say thank you and, and encourage people who might think that historical novels are not for them uh, because you have such a different take on those topics. Um, and I was wondering if that was intentional on your part and how you, you know, came about and, and made that idea that you might have then into to reality on, on, on paper. Yes, it was very intentional. Um, as much as that sort of learning about the Grand Tour was was influential on this book, the other big influence was when I was was doing university and was thinking about what I wanted to study. I I specifically wanted to study the Wars of the Roses in England, which are these very sort of the very upper upper crust kings fighting kings. Only like two percent of the population even knew there was a war going on, and they were all it was a lot, it was like the toxic masculinity of war, which is already really toxic and masculine. Um, <laughs> because it was so when you look at the history at face value, it's so male. It's all white men fighting each other. Um, and I worked with a social historian in the UK whose her specific area of, of interest was women in the Wars of the Roses. And when you look at them sort of at face value, it does not appear that there are any women in the Wars of the Roses. And working with her was very uh was very transformative for me in terms of how I thought about history and how I learned that these stories of of women and POCs and queer people and trans people and all of these minorities that we think are sort of new to us today that we mm -hmm. tend to fall into that trap are people that have existed forever um, and that history is not a a a slow climb up a mountain in terms of progress and representation and rights. It is instead something that gets better and gets worse and is incredibly varied. And I, I always tell people, if you think about the, the queer experience, if we talk about, and this is a sort of American centric idea because that's where I, I live, but I tell kids when I talk to them, like, if we think about the queer experience in America today, we understand that there is no one queer experience. There are, it depends on your your race, your religion, your socioeconomic station, it depends on your your parents and where they're from. Like there's so many things that influence your, your experience as a queer person in America in 2021. When we talk about history, we tend to say everybody before 19, everyone before rent came out was sad and oppressed and couldn't be with the people they loved and were persecuted and, and died. Like we, t we have this like monolith for every queer person before before modern times, when really like the queer experience in history was just as varied. And that goes for that goes for women, that goes for POCs. Everyone had their own experience that was informed by by so many different factors. And so learning about this first through the lens of women, um, and then simultaneously, so I grew up in a very uh conservative environment and didn't have a lot of sort of space to explore uh, explore gender and sexuality and things like that. And then when I went abroad, something that I, that was something that was really, really opened my eyes to. And, and especially I was able to to think about sexuality and I, I met queer people for the first time and, and found my sort of first queer community, but then came back home and was back in this community that I did not feel like was ever going to change. And so I, I found a lot of comfort and stories I could relate to in the stories of queer people in history who have an identity that feels sometimes fundamentally at odds with their community. And it's like, how do I honor both who I am, but also where I come from? And how do I acknowledge these two sort of dueling parts of myself? And so that's something that had always fascinated me and also affirmed me a lot in finding stories of, of queer people through history and knowing like, we're not the first people going through this. We're not the first generation to exist. Like we have existed forever we have existed everywhere there has been history we have been making history forever and it's not just about 
queer people who have survived their lives. It's about queer people who have thrived and who have found ways to be with the people they loved and, and make, make lives and relationships and make real change in history. And so going into these books, I sort of had all of this in my brain and all of this frustration that I had not seen this variable, this, this variance of experience represented in historical fiction. And I love historical fiction. I know a lot of people are like you. Um, and they, it, it's sometimes a fight to get people to read these books and you say, Oh no, they're set in history. And they're like, now pass. Um, <laughs> but I very consciously wanted to, to make the, pretty much every character in the book characters that I had not seen in uh, in historical adventure novels previously because their presence would have been deemed anachronistic when really what, what's anachronistic is the way we think about minority representation in history often. So you have Monty who's, who's um, bisexual. Uh, he's dealing with PTSD throughout the book too and um, continues to deal with that through the series. You have Percy, who's biracial, his mother was um, a, a slave in, oh God, I can't even remember the country, uh, I think Barbados, uh, <laughs> somewhere in the Caribbean, and his father, I wrote these books a while ago, um, <laughs> and his father was a, a white English uh, naval officer who was stationed there, and uh, then when Percy was born, brought him back, and he was raised by sort of a white upper class uh, family, uh, which is a real, a real a real situation based on the real story of uh, Dido Elizabeth Bell, who was a, a biracial woman who was raised in sort of upper crust society. And there's a great film about her. I'm, now I'm going off on a tangent. But there's a great <laughs> film about her that everybody should watch with uh, Gugu Mbatha-Ra. Uh, and then Felicity, who is uh, later on in the book, she talks about sort of identifying as what I think we would think of now as being asexual. Um, she's very sort of... Uh, not interested in traditional gender roles, but then has to have her own kind of reckoning with uh, her own, the way she looks at femininity and the way she sort of associates, the way the world has sort of conditioned her to associate femininity with weakness. And uh, we have Sim in the second book, who's the, the pirate girl that Felicity ends up teaming up with. And uh, Sim is a Muslim woman. Um, she's the daughter of a pirate. Uh, she's I'm going to start spoiling things if I keep talking. My point is, history, <laughs> is very, history is very diverse. And it's, it's, it's our fault that we don't tell these stories and we don't share these stories. And, and it's so much easier to keep perpetrating these myths that history was all about white men doing things. Yeah. And I think it's so important now that we have these resources, we have these stories, we need to be the last generation for which that myth exists. And we need to start uh, challenging this idea of, of whitewashing and straightwashing history. Yeah. That was such a long answer. I have so much to say on this. I could talk for the whole event just about this. And just, yeah, I, and I find it so interesting. And, uh, and also, so uh, what I love about YA is how progressive it is in comparison to uh, adult literature. Um, when it comes to diversity and representation, without it being, you know, this is these are adventure stories. These are, in in a lot of ways, really traditional YA, but they also feature topics such as, you know, race and sexuality and gender norms uh, and. You know, as I swooned over Percy in the first book, I was, you know, Felicity is this kick-ass <laughs> uh, girl who wants to become a doctor and she cannot, uh, for the life of her, understand why it is an obstacle for her as a woman to be a doctor um, and how she's consistently pushing and pushing towards these boundaries that the society puts up for her. So I, I love that, but it's also a love yeah. story and it's uh, a story about family and loyalty and so there is so much interwoven in these stories that you do so skillfully by the way uh, that I really really love uh, and to be able to see yourself no matter what the subject is if it's I mean Percy has something going on with him um, that could be an obstacle in his life, um, except 
you know, the uh, the race uh, issue, him being a mixed race uh, person. And, and as I said, you know, Felicity, she's not allowed to do the same thing as her her brother. Uh, and, you know, there are so much to identify, even though they are historical novels. And, and you do it also in a, in a language that, yes, they, they are set way back, but they feel very contemporary. Um, yeah, so I'm 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 fangirling over here. So that's me going yeah, on a tangent. Can, can I hire you to follow me around and hype my books for me? <laughs> um, you 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 sparked a memory when when you were talking about that. Uh, so one of the things when I was doing research, uh, I read a lot of journals of young people who had taken the Grand Tour in the 1700s, and you can still access a lot of there. And lots of them were writing letters home, and they're keeping. Uh, journals, and so I read a lot of those. Um, and in particular, there's a, a gentleman named James Boswell, who was a very famous diarist and writer of the time. And so his accounts of his grand tour are very, very well preserved. Um, and I remember when I was reading them, there's so much of it that's just like, I was like, oh my God, I can't relate to this. It's so like, uh, I'm at the opera and I'm very wealthy, and which countess should I seduce? And I'm like, okay, shut, like, these are such like top tier white guy problems and there was a lot of that but then there would every once in a while be an entry that was something like today I didn't get out of bed all day because I felt so gloomy and like I was such a waste of space and I just don't even know what the point of my life is and I was like oh no that I can relate to yeah. um, and so finding those moments in history those like incredibly human moments that yeah. that connect us over the centuries and and remind you that people are I mean people are people and people don't really change we all we all end up looking for and wanting the same things. And, and so those were finding those moments in my research and finding stories of, of women and queer people and, and getting to share those stories were such like important things for me in writing these books and such touchstones for me as I did the research for them. Yeah. And, and what I find is that that is not the things that seems inaccurate or made up. Those are the things that most believable. That Monty, he's, I, I, from my understanding, he doesn't label himself as either bisexual or homosexual. It's just, mm. you know, he's 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 a person and he falls in love and is attracted to uh, different genders. Um, so that is not made up. What is made up <laughs> is, you know. Uh, other things that happens in the book. It's as, the literal magical element yeah. in the book. <laughs> uh, so, it, so I think that that is very skillfully done as well. To So that could have happened. We just don't know about it because that's not how history has been written. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, a long tangent. So you have talked about the, um, the research that you put into... Um, the the story arc of of the grand tour but there are several more aspects to it uh in felicity's stories there are a lot of you know anatomy and science so how much research combined in these books have you <laughs> you had to do um enough to write three more books that are just <laughs> Like I, I do so much research for these books and so much of it never ends up on the page, which can be both really frustrating, uh, but also is so important because it sort of forms the, it's, it's like, it's like if you're standing in a room, you maybe notice one or two things about it or you sit on a particular chair, but it's everything else about the room that really forms a complete picture. It's the books yeah. on the shelves. It's the, and so it's important for me as the writer to know how to furnish the room, even if I'm not pointing out every single detail to my readers. So I do very broad strokes research where I will read sort of broadly about what's going on at the time period, what it's like to go on a grand tour, different things like that, sort of what's socially and politically happening in Europe. And, and sometimes that informs the plot as you see in, in both of those books. Um, and read sort of broadly about, about the lives of queer people, the lives of, of young English lords, um, at the time period, uh, and try to get sort of a, a, a larger scale picture of what's going on at the time and then winnow it down. 
um, and then get more and more specific in my research, take things from my research that I'm finding, use them to inform the story and then dig deeper in. And so you end up kind of going um, back and forth between your story is informing your research and your research is informing your story. Um, in the case of those two books, I was really lucky that I have visited everywhere that Monty and Felicity go. Um, and that was when I, when I first, because when I was first writing the gentleman's guide in my like fit of, of, of wild insanity where I was just like, put it all in. Um, <laughs> I, I mapped out where they went based on my favorite cities I'd gone to when I was over in Europe and places I wanted to write about and that had been so inspiring to me and then had to do a little bit of gymnastics to get them to a couple of them because like I remember <laughs> reading, I, I remember reading, um, about Spain because I love Barcelona and I loved going there and was just so caught off guard by how beautiful Barcelona was. And then doing research, uh, I read in a book uh, that was like an old, it was a from the 1700s, a guidebook for grand tourists. And it was like, go anywhere in Europe, don't go to Spain. Spain's terrible. The roads are terrible. <laughs> Carriages can't get through. You got to cross mountains. Don't do it. It's like, great. Got it got to fictionalize this a little bit um but then the other Which thing is too, lucky that that the, this was not you know a non-fiction or an academic yeah text. yeah <laughs> you can do whatever you of, want with your that's why I moved out of academia um but it's interesting too I always uh I always hit a point where you have to stop doing the research and the research just becomes a way to avoid actually working on the book Mm. Um, and you never feel ready. I, I've had lots of people ask me, like, when do you feel ready? When do you know you know enough? And when do you know you've researched enough that you're ready to start writing? And the answer is you don't. You just kind of have to start before you're ready. And I always, it, it's, it's remarkable to me how every time I write a book, I go through that every single time. And every time I'm like, I'm not ready. I don't know enough. But there's still so much I have to learn. And you just kind of have to start writing and then learn as you go and understand mm. that you can read for years and years and years about grand tours in the 1700s. And then two pages into your book, you get to a scene, you're like, I have no idea what they would eat at a restaurant. I have no <laughs> idea what a restaurant would look like. Like, do you order off a menu? Do you order off a, is there a prefix? Like, and so you're going to have to sit and do like four hours of spot research trying to figure out what the hell they would eat at a <laughs> restaurant in the 1700s. And then that scene will probably get cut from the book. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's a lot of, it's a lot of research beforehand and then a lot of sort of spot research as you go. And with things like the anatomy and, and the medicine and, and Felicity's knowledge, I, it's very tricky to write characters that know more than you do. And so <laughs> I, I feel like I always do just enough research. It's always depth instead or breadth instead of depth. So I do just enough research that I can convincingly pretend I know what I'm talking about. But generally, if you pressed me on any of that anatomy stuff, I would have no idea what I was talking about. So McQuin uh, McKinsey, I have now <laughs> conducted a test on the anatomy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, no, my worst nightmare. <laughs> no, no. Um, so no, based on my my shoddy memory, it also seems if you tested me on these books, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> Uh, as I said in the beginning, this is a collaboration with Uppsala Public Library and their YA reading group. Uh, and they have sent in some questions. So if it's okay with you, I yeah. am going to ask them. And then also uh, encourage you to, if you have a question for Mackenzie, to write them in the, in the live chat. Uh, so one of the questions is, I have always wanted to be a writer. I'm wondering at what age you wrote your first book and at what and at what age your first book got published? Um the I'll start with the second part. The, the, I was 24 when my first book got published, which is is very young. Um yeah. <laughs> and I think we tend to uh sort of fetishize youth in art fields and so there's always sort of the the extra shine to a story where it's like, not only is this person a great artist, but they're only 18 or they're, mm. they're only 23. And I, I, so I always say like, I was 24 with the caveat that there is no age limit. There is no cutoff date. There is no, you must have published a book by this age or else you're never going to, you're never going to succeed. And that applies to anything in life. You're never too old to, to change your career, to try something new, to, to start over. Um, um, and so I was, I was quite young. I had a very lucky experience where a lot of things fell into line for me in that I did a, a master's degree in creative writing, 
um, I happened to, again, this is what we were talking about earlier, yeah. that things just kind of happened to happen. I happened to read uh, at a, a MFA night where we all presented our work, where there was an agent who liked my book and she picked up that book and that book sold almost, I think like a month after I graduated from my MFA. So it was, it was a, a very lucky charm situation. Um, and so, yeah, my caveat to that is I was 24, but it, you can do it at any age. Um, yeah. And there is no expiration date on, on doing what you want to do. In terms of the age when I wrote my first book, um, I would say probably my, my first like book length thing that I wrote was fan fiction. And I wrote a ton mm. of fan fiction when I was in high school and had no aspirations of being a writer, had no interest in a career in, in creative writing or book writing, but I loved writing and reading fan fiction. And looking back now, I realized that that was so foundational for me in terms of learning how to write, um, learning how to craft characters, learning tropes, learning even like by, by taking stories and properties that I really loved and then, um, saying, okay, so I love this about, I love Star Wars, but here's some things I don't like about Star Wars, so let's change it and fix it. Um, and so learning how to like, uh, to, I don't know, have agency over, over stories and, and change things that I wasn't happy with, um, was, was hugely influential on me. So I wrote book length works as a teenager, but did not consider them books and did not think that I was a writer and did not think I would ever be a writer. Yeah. <laughs> well, luckily, fate had it otherwise. <laughs> Here um, we are. Yeah. Uh, the second question is, uh, what was the inspiration for Mackenzie? And we have talked about this. Um, and do you have a favorite scene or moment in the gentleman or ladies guide that did not make the final version? Um, and what can we expect in the new books about the siblings? And will Max be a part of it? Oh, Max. <laughs> oh, Max. Truly the, the, the character that carries the series on his back. Um, <laughs> for those of you who have not read the series, Max is a dog uh, that makes a, a brief but impactful cameo in the second book. Uh, let's see, what was the, oh, the first part was uh, things that didn't make it into the book. Um, yeah. I sort of, because it's necessary, when I cut things from the book, I have to immediately forget they exist. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you get so attached to everything you put in there that it's always like, oh, I can't cut this. This is this is so important. And then as soon as you cut it, you're like, oh my gosh, why did I ever think that belonged in the book? <laughs> um, and so I have to sort of like, it's that whole kill your darling thing. And I have to immediately forget my darlings ever existed or else I, I missed them. Um, there was a there was a scene in Lady's Guide, or sort of maybe an extended version of a scene, uh, where, where Felicity was, was, was kind of ribbing Percy playfully about Monty and, um, how he's not gonna be, he's not gonna be good looking forever. Like someday he's not gonna be handsome and you're gonna realize how obnoxious he is and, um, and he's gonna get old and all of this stuff. And she says something, she said something about like, uh, when you when you get old or wh when he grows old when you when you two grow old i don't even remember what the line was and percy says like well i plan to um and she's like what do you plan to do and so he says i plan to grow old with your brother um and i was like this is like i wrote that line and i was like nailed it this is so <laughs> cute and it just it just kind of clunked in the scene and i couldn't find anywhere else to put it and i remember being so <laughs> devastated so i was like this is the most romantic thing i've ever written and i have to cut it and i was so sad so yeah, I'll have to, I might have to find that because I'm sure I have it saved somewhere and put it on my Instagram or something. Yeah. Like somebody being like, oh, this is so good. And I'm, I'm cutting it. It's devastating. Um, <laughs> in, oh, in terms of the third book. Uh, so there's a third book coming out. The third book is about, uh, Yay! Adrian Montague. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the third Montague who makes only kind of a very passing appearance in the first book, uh, yeah. because he's a baby. Um, and part of Monty, you know, it's screaming and yeah, the worst yeah. baby that ever babied. Um, part of Monty's sort of uh, uh, change of or the, the urgency of Monty's grand tour and of him getting his life together is that before he was sort of the only heir to his his family name, so he could do whatever he wanted, and still this title would inevitably go to him. And now suddenly his mother's had 
another baby and it's a boy and he's like, oh no, I gotta, I gotta shape up or else I don't know what my life's gonna look like because now there's a, now there's a spare. So I have a replacement. Um, and so, uh, the, the third book, which is called The Nobleman's Guide to Shipwrecks and Scandals. Oh God, I can't remember if it's Scandals and Shipwrecks or Shipwrecks and Scandals. Either way. Um, <laughs> scandals and Shipwrecks. Scandals and Shipwrecks. I knew whichever one I said was gonna be the wrong one. Um, <laughs> so that that one takes place. Um, I think about. I think we decided it's about fifteen or sixteen years after Ladies' Guide. So Adrian's grown up. Uh, he's about he's about eighteen or nineteen. Um, he's now in the same spot as Monty, where he's sort of ready to take over over the family estate. Of, but has has issues of his own, I guess. Uh, uh, he doesn't know he has two siblings because it's. Spoiler alert, it's kind of inevitable. At the end of Gentleman's Guide, they all kind of uh, abandon their proper English upbringing and go to live life on their own terms, uh, <laughs> which I don't feel bad about spoiling because a lot of people when they hear it's queer characters and historical immediately are like, okay, well, somebody's going to die. They're going to yeah. they're gonna end up apart from each other. And so I always tell people, like, it's not a spoiler. I don't want it to be a spoiler that it is a, a no caveats, happy ending to Gentleman's Guide. Um, so, everyone's, so Adrian doesn't know he has these siblings. Uh, he his mother has just died who his mom was like his person in the world and his mom was was someone who uh made him feel less weird and alone and adrian has really crippling um crippling anxiety and his mom dealt with similar things during her life and she was always kind of the one who he could go to and she would be like no it's okay like we're we're going to get through this and now she's died he feels very on his own and very unprepared for the future ahead of him and in spite of being very politically active and having all these, he's very progressive and sort of wants to undo a lot of the work his conservative father has done. He just is so scared of everything and so scared of himself and, and struggles with that. Um, so he discovers uh, an artifact that his mother has left behind after she died that then sends him looking for these lost siblings he didn't know he had um, and then sends them, of course, gallivanting again um, <laughs> so so it was really fun to get to uh revisit because i think authors get asked a lot like what happens to your characters after the books and generally yeah, which some of uh the questions they are very <laughs> you know detailed what happened to helena and dante and uh, and their family that was one of the questions well, yes see, almost People always my be very invested in both the main and the you know the side <laughs> characters. <laughs> well, I'm I'm usually very disappointing with my answers because usually when people ask those things, I'm just like, I don't know, whatever you want to happen. <laughs> and so it it was kind of wild to get to revisit these characters almost 20 years after you first meet them in the Gentleman's Guide, and yeah. not only to revisit them and to think about where their lives have gone, but to see them now through a new character and see them through Adrian, who doesn't know who doesn't know them and who's getting to know them and who's getting mm. to know them both as people they were as as young people when we saw them in the books and now as the people they are now. Um, and it's fun in terms of character work and it's also fun in terms of like dropping in little Easter eggs from the previous book. Um, one, of the, of the, one, of the, one of my favorite things this is a small spoiler for Nobleman's Guide, but I'll share it anyway. Um, one of my favorite reoccurring jokes in the series is that Monty is very short. Um, and that was one of those things that I like sort of put in in the first draft thinking like, oh, this is, you know, a detail about him is that he's short. And then it became this like extended joke over the whole series that he's furious that he's this like, <laughs> he's very short. Percy's very tall and, yeah. and Monty's constantly sort of like insecure and about his height. And it's, it's one of my favorite running gags in the series. And, um, I had a lot of fun bringing that back in Nobleman's Guide because Adrian is extraordinarily tall uh, <laughs> through some genetic mutation and Monty is furious about this fact that his so brother he's the, is like, the tall little brother <laughs> he is yeah <laughs> and then there's little like five foot tall uh, Monty well, who's just like I, angry the whole time yeah <laughs> uh, our time is running out unfortunately oh, no. I, no I can I can be here, you know, the whole... I know, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> all day. Yeah, I can see there are a lot of love and, you know, praise in the comment section, both, 
you know, people who have read all the books and some who are now, you know, really enthusiastic to dive into Felicity's story, for instance. Uh, but I will pick up one question that I saw, and that is how do you balance when it comes to language, the historical language and, and modern speak? Um, so how did you, you I, work with that? <clears throat> I always opt for... I never want to lose readers or isolate readers or pull them out of the story because there is language they don't understand or language that clunks or language that feels impossibly dated. Because the, the truth is like these characters would be using words and phrases that both we we don't know and that we don't have context for that haven't survived and also things that have survived but we now understand in a totally different context. So I always opt on the side of of the readers and the story. And so I, my balance comes from knowing, knowing the options and knowing what the historical language would look like and then making an informed decision about whether or not it would, it would pull the reader out or affect their understanding of the story. So I think it's, it's again, it's that when it's the, the dressings of the room versus the like few key pieces is as an author, I have to know why I'm making this choice. I have to know what I'm doing and what I'm saying and then make it as a conscious decision and not as a uninformed one. Yeah. Uh, so we will take one final question, and that is, uh, I love writing, but I struggle with getting a longer and consistent plot. Any tips on how to come up with and map out plot? I also struggle with this, to be honest. Um, I have a really hard time with plot. I wish I could just write like, which is kind of what the novella is. I wish I could just write like characters swanning around in their feelings for <laughs> hundreds of pages. Um, I have found, so I was not an outliner for a long time. I always kind of just wrote by the seat of my pants. And I felt like I was, I always used to say, I, I wrote like driving in the dark where you can only see as far as your headlights go, but you have to keep driving in order to see any further. And I still do that to some extent, but I, I'm working for, I'm working on a series for Marvel right now. And uh, because of the nature of working with those characters and working with such a large corporation and with so many people who have to approve everything to keep it all consistent and in canon, I've had to become an outliner and I've had to sit down and really like outline these books before I write them. And it's been frustratingly helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I have a kind of, I've kind of become an outliner um, in terms of drawing out the plot and making a full plot. I think you ha it's helpful to think of, uh, your characters as active participants in the plot and not mm -hmm. as people who are having things happen to them, but as people who are making choices that are then affecting the things around them. And so if your characters are making choices, then sort of re, uh, what word, reconfiguring their, their world based on, or I guess it's, if your characters are making choices, then experiencing the consequences of those choices and then making another choice because of that, that's the most effective way to think of your story. And the places where I usually get stuck or or can't figure out how to move forward are the places where my character is not taking action, but where action is being, things are happening to them or action is being taken upon them. Yeah, when they're um, not an, an active subject in exactly, their Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I outlining helps me, planning it out helps me. Um, also, I would say look at stories that you love and look at books that you you love and look at them as as stories and as pieces of craft and study them and say like, okay, why is this effective? Why does this work? Why does this story, what propels this story forward and learn from, yeah. from books and stories that you love? Isn't a very common uh, tip to, if you want to be a writer, you need to be a reader. Um, oh my and gosh, to, yeah. Uh, and to consistently read. And a good point, a starting point. <laughs> plugging. <laughs> if you've never uh, read a book before, this is a great one to start with. Uh, you have a great start. So the the third book, uh, full-length novel uh, in the series will be out in November, am I right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which means that we can read and reread these. Uh, yeah, until read then. only those until it comes yeah. out. Thank you so much, Mackenzie, and thank oh you gosh, for this all. Is so yeah. wonderful! Thank you for such a great conversation. Uh, it was, and I will now, you know, start over and um, 
get to, you know, rediscover these characters one more time before, you know, the, the final book is out. So thank you everybody for writing such a sweet comments and, and questions. And uh, thank you, Mackenzie. It was such a treat to talk to you. I'm so sorry I talked too much and so we weren't able to get to more audience questions. No, I, no, no. Uh, I was told, you know, I'm just here fangirling. We were, we so, I, <laughs> so thank you so much and it's everybody so have a good you. day. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Bye. <laughs> thank you so much, Johanna and Mackenzie. That was amazing. Um, I had so much fun listening to you and I hope our audience did as well. Um, thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for your continued support. And before we say goodbye for the evening, I just wanted to remind you that you can order copies, sign copies for space um, through the link um, and read them, read them. There's absolutely- Buy good. them. <laughs> <laughs> Them. Them. <laughs> didn't get through, just read them because they're super brilliant um, and they're also sort of exactly the pick me up you need this during this pandemic because sort of you travel in, in mind and you travel in history and you travel through Europe and they're absolutely brilliant um, and you can order them signed um, through the links <laughs> in the live stream or at bookshop.se and um, I also want to say that um, we have two more author events coming up. So get ready for David Levithan and Victoria Aviard. Um, coming up, David Levithan, the 12th of May, and Victoria Aviard, the 3rd of June. So you see, we have the best authors <laughs> coming <laughs> live um, to the English bookshop. Well, live ish. So online live and with that i wish you all a very pleasant evening and thank you again johanna and uh, mackenzie and we'll hopefully see you all again either in the shop or online bye bye thank you bye. <laughs>